welcome to this beautiful uh, place and time. It's really a privilege to see you all gathered. And there is something biblical about this place. There is Zacchaeus tree here. We have the view on the Mount of Olives across the valley. That's the Kidron Valley down there. We could we could do a. You don't need to go to the Holy Land. You can't nowadays. So come here. Uh, I want to say hi to Pastor James. Probably not watching us now. Who knows? Um, I've been asked to uh, keep teaching in the book of Mark, and. Um, I like the uh, idea of looking in the book, in the Bible, for texts that make sense, that are connected together. Um, we tend to study Mark 10, then Mark 11, and take a whole chapter. But you have to remember that the division in chapters and in, uh, in verses were not inspired hopefully inspired some ways, but they were not done by the, the original writers. And sometimes, um, and two guys did that, the Archbishop of Canterbury in 2027, uh, tw sorry, 1227, a long time ago, um, divided the Bible in two chapters. His name was Stephen, Stephen Langton, 1227. And then a French guy by the name of Robert Etienne in 1551 decided to divide the chapters in verses. All that to say that today I'm not going to teach the whole chapter uh, Mark 11, but we are going to see a piece of the scriptures that you know, make sense together. It's the same thought continued by the by Mark, the author. It's um, what we call a pericope, and I know you've been using that method to teach through the book of Mark, and it's a great method to try to tie together a, a dying fig tree and. Um, different, uh, a triumphal entry, a donkey, things that if you don't follow the, the thought of the author, and the author is Mark on the human point of view, but it's really the Holy Spirit inspiring that text. So we are going to see different um, passages. We are going to study Mark, Mark 11 from verse 1 to 25, or we are going to try to in a short time. Um, we'll first look at what is usually called the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem. It's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday, Le Dimanche des Rameaux, it's interesting to note that it's such an important event that it's uh, described in the four Gospels. And it's not very often that you find the same event described in all four Gospels. I'll read, if you want to follow, uh, I read from the ESV. Verse 1, chapter 11 of Mark. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter, if you will find it, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, 
the Lord has need of it and we'll send it back when here immediately and they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street and they untied it and some of those standing there said to them what are you doing untying the colt and they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it and many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the field and those who went before and those who followed were shouting Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David Hosanna in the highest and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late he went out to Bethany with the twelve we'll pause here we have uh, the habit of calling it the triumphal entry and the idea is to make a connection with the Romans triumphs where a general who had conquered an area of the, their vast empire would come back to Rome and be celebrated. But what we see here is a far cry, it's very far-fetched from what a general, a Roman general would have expected for a triumphal entry. They, first of all, we see the the knowledge of, of Jesus. Maybe he had arranged it, but I, I'm on the point of view that he knew that they would find a, a donkey, the fall of a, don a donkey, a colt, in a place where he told them to, to go, and they would people would say, hey, what are you doing? You know, it's like somebody comes and pick up the van there. You say, hey, what's going on? And then they would say, just the Lord has need of it and just to, a little remark here it's kind of strange to have that those two words the Lord has need of something and maybe you didn't know but the Lord has need of you he wants you to be involved in his kingdom sharing his person sharing the kingdom but he doesn't need us in a sense he wants us to be part of it but for us it's the same we we need to reply we need to to respond they were uh, staying with their friends Mary Martha and Lazarus in Bethany and they would go this was the last week of Jesus before his crucif crucifixion we think this is on Saturday when he goes and gets the donkey he goes back and on Sunday uh, we see that in other uh, in the book of John the Gospel of John we see that people were coming to see him after he had done some miracles and uh, the Galileans who had seen his miracles were pretty positive about him the crowd that says Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord we think they are from Galilee they have seen him do miracles they like him the people that will say crucify him two days later a few days later were more the people of Jerusalem and Judea who were manipulated by the, the high priest and the elders. We say it's not m much like a, a triumphal entry, you know. We, we think of Jesus coming on a white horse at the end of times in Revelation 21 and, and, and following here is on a donkey this shows humility but at the same time we know that uh, David 
and others were riding donkeys as a sign of royalty. They must have been very special donkeys. This one never had never been mounted, but for some reason he didn't try to reject the Jesus when he sat on it, you know, which is a good thing. So we see him being praised and they were quoting Psalm 118 verse 25 and 26 Hosanna means save it's the same wor root word as Jesus Yehovah Shua salvation Hosanna some of them could have been yelling save us meaning save us from the Roman domination from the occupation of the Romans, but others were saying, save us from, meaning from our, ourselves, from our sins. And then we have this passage, we'll read verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. I have to admit, the first time I was a new Christian, I, I came to the Lord late in life, around 30. 33 years old when I read that passage I thought is that like when you put a coin in the vending machine and the, the coke bottle won't fall all the way down so you get mad at the machine and you kick it you know no actually Jesus uses that fig tree for a lesson for us There is confusion about the fig and the, and the leaves, the fruit and the leaves. I've been reading and it says that in, in, in that part of the world, there is a first batch of little figs that come before the leaves, or with the leaves first, and then those figs fall down and they are followed by a, a real crop. So when you see leaves, you were, in, you were the right to expect some, some little feast. And that's what Jesus was doing. Um, we jumped here after that to verse 15. talks about Jesus cleansing the temple. And uh, we go back to the, fig, the poor fig tree in verse 20 where Peter, or they passed by in the morning, verse 20, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And then Jesus is going to do a study, uh, a lesson, use that as a lesson. But that's, so we see first the triumphal entry. Some people were receiving Jesus with joy and celebration. I prayed a while ago, just a few minutes, saying, I was listening to Pastor James teaching here a few weeks ago. And I barely could hear him because of the noise of the cigala, the cicadas. They were singing, they were joyful, they were saying, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were knowing, they, they affirmed that the father, David, David was the father, there would be an everlasting kingdom. Save us in the highest. We see that they are receiving. The question is, are we receiving Jesus the same way? Maybe you say, oh, I did that 35 years ago. But are you receiving every day, every morning, 
something, Jesus, come in within me and talk to me and show me what I must do. The fig tree was what you could call uh, a false promise. He was, um, you, you would see it and you would think there should be fruit on it. And you came and there was no fruit. This is a lesson also for us. Do we bear fruit? Or are just are we just leafy? Leafy with church attendance? Leafy with good words to say, but inside we don't really care about the Lord. We are not producing fruit. The fruit that the, the biggest fruit and you know fruit is we have the list of the fruit in, in Galatians. The first one is love. And uh, in Revelation, in the church at Ephesus, there were a lot of good things that Jesus commanded them for. But they, they had lost the, the biggest fruit they could have borne, which was your first love. And we need to ask ourselves, are we bearing that fruit of love, which goes to bring people to Jesus, it will bring comfort. People will come and ask you and you, you, you will be able to explain to them the gospel. Your life will be a testimony and you will bear fruit. We don't want the Lord to tell us you'll never feed anyone again. We see also now that verse 15 that he goes and, and cleans, cleanses the temple. We know in John that he had already done that earlier in his ministry. They came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the table of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. They, they go back. It's, we think it's Tuesday that the episode with what we call Palm Sunday was really Palm Monday from some scholars. And this is Tuesday that he curses the fig tree and now he cleanses the temple. And um, the problem with the temple is that it was bad inside. It was um, there was a lot of hypocrisy from the chief priests and the elders, the religious people responsible. They had used their religious prerogatives to make money. Today we, we can find those same kinds of ill-spirited people in televangelism where they try to get you to give money, seed money that will bring you much more money later. 
But in the meantime, it's enriching them and their ministry. They had devised a racket whereby you had to change the money. You couldn't give your, your coins coming from where you were. They had to be temple coins. And when they changed the money, they took a, a cut. They took a interest. The same for the animals. When they were bringing animals to sacrifice, they would check them and see if there were any blemishes. And if there were, they said, no, not good, you have to buy one of our good ones here. And in a sense, that whole passage is what they are doing to Jesus. He's being inspected to see if he's a, a lamb worthy of the, for the sacrifice. And um, he was... He was, Jesus was mad with the rightful wrath, rightful anger, because he saw that they were exploiting people who were seeking God. They were exploiting pilgrims. They were also desecrating God's holy place, the temple, which was a place where man could meet with God and turn into... Uh, a stock exchange and a, a rural fair with the cows coming in, the, the noise of the, the sheep that were going to be sacrificed. There was no respect for God in that place. And I think what was really getting him mad is that My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. They had turned a place that was supposed to be a place of prayer for every man on earth. For all the nations, for the Gentiles too. They were supposed to be coming close to God. And now... There were, there was, in the in the court of the Gentiles, there were people moving their fairs, their uh, equipment to go to as a shortcut to to Jerusalem. All the nations, and I, I know some of you. I know you have a burden to share the gospel with all the nations. Praise the Lord. That's his heart. He wants to touch them. You know, the to get close to God, you had to be, you know, it, it was not easy to, to approach the Holy of Holies. You know, if you're a Gentile, you, you stayed in the Gentile area. And you said, oh, I'm not a Gentile, I'm a Jew. But I'm a woman. Oh, sorry, you can't go that far only. And then you said, well, I'm not, I'm not a woman, I'm Jew, so I can get closer. Oh yeah, but in the courts of the Israelites, no closer. And then there were some privileged men who were priests, and they would say, Oh, I can go past all those gates, all those little barriers, and get to the... No, you have to be the high priest to get into the Holy of Holies, to get close to God. And that's what Jesus accomplished at the cross. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the, comes to the Father but through me. He has blasted out those things. And he was so mad to see those guys using their privileges to keep away people from God, especially the Gentiles. Let's be careful not to keep people at bay. Sometimes we, we want well, but we might use um, our religious language. Have you been, and not, not too long ago, somebody I know was invited to, to visit a friend and his mom 
came to him, he was not a Christian, and she came to him and she asked him, have you already been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? He almost ran away right on the spot, but he didn't want to have anything to do. And we have to be careful, we have to be a bridge, not a wall, when we talk to people. So, we see the lesson, um, we see that the, you, you remember that Jesus never wanted to be announced as the king in public. Often he, he, he would heal people and he would say, don't tell anyone. And he, sa he would say, my hour hasn't come yet, but now his hour has come. He has instructed his disciples to find a donkey and by doing this he's not only fulfilling Zechariah 9 9 which says that the Lord will be coming on the fall of a donkey in Jerusalem he's also fulfilling the greatest of all prophecies the prophecy of Daniel 9 24 through 27 the prophecy of the 70 weeks so now he's not we might not have the time to get it. I'll see at the end if I have time to go back to that. But this is the greatest prophecy announcing that he would come to Jerusalem April 6, 3080. And that's the very day where he entered already. They didn't want him to, they didn't want, they wanted to kill him, but they didn't want to kill him during the feast of Passover because there were about two million people in town and they, they know it could be a revolt, a rebellion. So they were trying to temporize, but Jesus forced them by what he was saying, by what he was doing to get them going. We see that to function properly, a community of believers must do what is said starting verse 22. Jesus answered them, Af you know, he, he just, they've just noticed the fig tree has been cursed. That's one of the rare destructive miracles of Jesus, besides the, the pig falling into the lake. And the fig tree that you curse has withered. And Jesus answers, Have faith in God. That shouldn't surprise you. If you have faith in God, you know, I thought some um, ecologists might think that it's bad to kill a tree like this. A poor little tree was quiet, you know, and suddenly is killed by Jesus and his words. But this was a, a cheap price to teach us a lesson. It, it tells us have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that he will that that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. We're not talking about asking God to put the bow de saint Janet dans la baie des anges. That's not what he's inviting us to do. The mountains here are the mountains in your life, the big problems, that strong, immovable thing that's in the way of what you want to do, what you want to accomplish for the Lord. And he says, have faith in God. He's not saying, have faith in faith, as the faith doctrine wants us to, to believe. He wants us to have a prayer of faith. He wants us also to know, to have expectations. And of course, you know, we don't have the time to do a study on the whole prayer theme, of course. 
could take years. But when you when you pray, you are supposed to pray according to Jesus' will. You're, if you are connected with Him, when you pray, you will be praying in accordance to His will. And will, He will delight to answer those questions. And that mountain, it will come to pass. It will be thrown into the sea. The, the hills will be made low. And then he has that principle, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Again, it's not trying to say, Lord, I, I know I'm going to get that, that nice villa with a swimming pool and it will come to pass. No, you are praying in accordance to God's will. The Holy Spirit puts a desire on your heart that's in accordance with the scriptures and you can go ahead and pray and expect it to, to be done. And he, he warns us of a, a danger with in prayer. And that danger is the danger of not doing that in love. Our prayers must be prayer of faith. There must be prayer of expectation and there must be prayer of love. He says, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness in my heart is a sure way to blow up my prayers. God is not going to honor my prayer if they are not full of forgiveness, love for the other one. But at the same time, if we do, then God is going to bless our lives. We see the disciples must receive their divine King Jesus in the right manner with worship and joy and love and attention. Thank you for being so attentive to this message this morning. That pleases me, but that doesn't matter. It pleases the Lord that you want to know more about Him and His ways. And the, the manual that you use to, um, to study with the Eric Copy by Abraham Kurubila says that your proper reception of him is proven by the fact that you become a community that functions properly. By that he means you dedicate yourself to prayer. I hear there is a prayer once a month here in this place or more probably. And your prayers are built upon faith and forgiveness. And that's a way to replace. We see that Jesus was harsh with this function. The, the temple was dysfunctioning. He was very harsh with the people that were, that were dysfunctioning there. He was uh, mad with the fig tree which was all pretense and no real reality, no reality at all. He, and that, those are dysfunctions. I like to say that we, in some ways, we are all dysfunctional. Our background, our family, the way we were raised, the language we talk makes us all some, somewhat dysfunctional. But Jesus wants to correct those dysfunctions. And he doesn't want to rem us to remain in a dysfunctional temple with a dysfunctional fig tree. 
He doesn't want us to have any pretense. He wants us to be cleansed from the inside. And this passage, this whole passage we glanced at, is really a way to warn the disciples, warn you and me, of the consequences of acting dysfunctional in our worship to God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for for your word. Thank you that sometimes it can seem uh, not related. Some passages seem like here is a piece there and and when we we get guidance from the Holy Spirit or from others, Lord, we see that it's all about function. You want us to function properly, Lord. You are our Savior. Every day we want to receive Him. We want to celebrate You. We want to be true about our witness with others. We want to be people of prayers. We want to be people that Forgive and love others, Lord. Thank you because we can ask you to do those things. They are things that you want to do for us. So we know you'll grant them to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.